All right, hello and welcome to this criminal law capsule and in this particular capsule um, I am going to be talking about the burden of proof in a criminal proceeding and so of course I will be focusing on something you've heard before the idea that a uh, an accused person has to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt so let's talk about what exactly that means there's actually quite a few different elements to this idea that you have to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and I want to go through um, a bunch of them just so you have a good understanding of how the burden of proof actually works. Let's be clear that there is both a sort of philosophical uh, importance to the burden of proof that ties into the idea that accused persons are presumed innocent until proven guilty, which is a very important protection in our society. But there's also, I want to start with a functional concern. And a burden of proof in a trial has a very functional role. So essentially, if you think about it, well, we have a trial, and we have somebody who has been charged, and we are thinking, well, what do we do? How do we decide whether this person is guilty of the particular crime? Well, the burden of proof is really important for sort of setting out the framework by which we decide whether or not this person is guilty. In effect, it sets the standard. It says, this person will not be guilty unless the burden of proof is met by a particular party, the crown, at a particular standard beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's the functional aspect of the burden of proof. It tells us the amount of evidence or the quantum of evidence that must be put forward enough to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And it also tells us who has to make that proof the crown, the crown being the prosecution in a particular case. So it's really important uh, part of understanding how the trial process works. That's why in a criminal trial it is the prosecution who starts. They have to put forth all their evidence against the defense and the defense can do nothing. They can stay silent, they can do absolutely nothing at all and simply challenge the prosecution's defense. And if at the end of that prosecution's evidence, the charge has not been met beyond a reasonable doubt, the defense, the defendant must be set free. That is the nature of our system. The presumption of innocence is not just something we talk about. It is literally uh, often described as the golden thread running through the criminal law. And the reason we have this lies because of the nature of the criminal sanction. And I will quote, actually, from the uh, Queen and Oaks, one of the most important cases uh, heard in the 20th century. Justice Dixon wrote very famously, that the presumption of innocence protects the fundamental liberty and human dignity of any and every person accused by the state of criminal conduct. An individual charged with a criminal offense faces grave social and personal consequences, including potential loss of physical liberty, subjection to social stigma, ostracism from the community. In light of the gravity of these consequences, the presumption of innocence is crucial. It ensures that until the state proves an accused guilt, the person is innocence. So that's why this is such an important uh, burden. It is incredibly important that the prosecution bears it, and it is a highly, highly cherished right in our system. In case after case, the Supreme Court has referred to this as one of the principal safeguards which seek to ensure that no innocent person, or as few as possible, are actually convicted. We use the burden of proof as a way of ensuring that even if a person is very likely guilty, we're not going to convict them, at least until we are sure. At least as sure as possible. And let's get that first element out of the way now. The burden of proof, beyond a reasonable doubt, is important and it is a high standard but it does not require perfection. We could, if we wanted to be sure that no innocent people were convicted, we could set a higher standard than beyond a reasonable doubt, but we don't do so. Because if we try to prevent miscarriages of justice by requiring a higher standard, uh, we, we could make one up. Let's say we, we set a standard that the Crown must prove guilt beyond any shadow of a doubt, beyond any doubt whatsoever. We would let a lot more people go free based on that standard, and that would have negative consequences. If we used a standard of any doubt whatsoever, it would demand an unreachable standard of perfection. It would essentially set the, the scales too far in favor of the accused. 
You could also argue that any doubt would also encourage speculation. That's one of the reasons that the term reasonable doubt is set out. We don't want any doubt whatsoever. We don't want people to speculate about what might have happened. We want reasonable doubts only to be considered. In a jury system, you can figure that many people have some funny doubts if you assemble enough of them together. And finally, as you'll learn later on, juries in this country have to be unanimous. If you include a standard of any doubt whatsoever with a need for jury unanimity, again, there's a real worry that you would unbalance the system further than you want it to be. So we do not demand perfection. We only require proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about um, what reasonable doubt actually means. If you're interested, there's a great little case called Lifchus, which is um, a a very short decision. You can find, uh, here's the following citation. It's short, it sets out the following, and there's a little bullet point list that explains what it is. But in short, a reasonable doubt is not a doubt based on, you know, sympathy or prejudice or, you know, vague ideas. It's based upon reason and common sense. It's logically connected to evidence. So essentially it has to be set out in something you've seen. It doesn't require proof to absolute certainty, but it's more than just that the accused is probably guilty. And if you only think the accused is probably guilty, well then the accused must be acquitted. That is the important part. So it's got to be a strong, strong case for guilt, but not an absolute case because that would just be too hard to actually prove. So a reasonable doubt means a doubt grounded in some uh, ascertainable reason. Let's start with what the burden of proof actually imposes when we get down to the nitty-gritty. And to begin with, it applies to every essential element of the case. Now, this is a little bit complex because we haven't talked about elements um, in any great depth yet. However, what we're going to look at is you're going to have to determine what are essential elements of the case and what are non-essential elements of the case. And what I mean by that is... For example, if we're talking about an assault, an essential element of the case, which I'll show you, is that somebody was uh, had force applied to them. What you will see is it's not necessarily an essential element that you applied force to a particular person. So you've got to be careful about what actually needs to be proven. That's going to depend upon a little bit, first, the crime with which you're charged, and also the particular indictment that the the Crown has actually set out. They've got to meet the indictment that they have actually um, um, charged you with. But that's getting a little bit more complicated than I want to uh, get at this moment. Let's just say for the moment that the burden of proof applies to every essential element of the case. If you have been charged with murder, the Crown has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you killed the person in question, that you caused their death, that you didn't act that caused their death, and that you intended or were uh, to kill them, or uh, or did the elements as set out in the criminal code and that you intentionally caused the act and were reckless about, uh, intended to cause them bodily harm and were reckless about whether death would ensue. In some sense, you have to meet the elements that are uh, uh, set out in the particular crime and you must do so for every element. If any element is not met, you have not proven guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So to flesh it out a little bit, here is a crime, and there is the actus reus and mens rea of the crime, as set out in the code. And here's what the Crown must prove. They must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused applied force, they did it intentionally, and that there was no consent. They also have to prove, D, that they didn't know that there was no consent. As you will see when we get to mens rea, that will be inferred as well. So those are the things the Crown has to prove. If they cannot prove any one of those things, an acquittal must be the result. And the interesting part is, it's also up to the prosecution to disprove any relevant defenses. The the criminal law does not treat defenses different than uh, elements of the offense. The burden of proof still rests with the Crown. So to take an example, if the accused says it was self-defense, I was defending myself, the jury must be convinced at the end of the day that it was not self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, everything I've just told you is true. 
but there's the last thing I want to finish off with is by reminding you that what I've just told you about the burden of proof is a common law rule. It's backed up by the Charter, but it is a common law rule, and thus it can be overturned by statute. There are a number of statutory provisions that reverse the burden of proof. Translation, the burden of proving elements and defenses Disproving defenses beyond a reasonable doubt always lies with the Crown unless the statute says otherwise. Here's an example. Section 253 of the Criminal Code sets out the following. Okay, This is the offense itself, but the key element I want to show you is everyone commits an offense who has the care or control of a motor vehicle. Care or control, that's the key element. And look at this. Very important section of the Criminal Code. If the police find the accused in the driver's seat of the vehicle, that person is deemed, which means automatically concluded, beyond a reasonable doubt, to have had the care or control of the vehicle unless the accused establishes they did not occupy the seat for the purpose of setting the vehicle in motion. Translation. The accused must prove on what has been found in the case law on a balance of probabilities, which is a lower standard than beyond a reasonable doubt, but still a significant standard, the opposite. Got it? If you can prove that the accused was in the driver's seat, the accused has to prove on a balance of probabilities that they did not occupy the seat for the purpose of setting the vehicle in motion. That is what is referred to as a reverse onus. And suddenly, the Crown does not have to prove care or control beyond a reasonable doubt because this presumption helps them do it automatically. Okay? And that's a very important uh, provision, obviously. Now, reversals of the burden of proof are automatically in violation of Section 11D of the Charter. That's just automatic. As soon as you have, a, they're the easiest ones to find. If the burden of proof is reversed, they violate Section 11B uh, D of the Charter, and they'll be struck down unless they're justified under Section 1. It's just straightforward. And all I can tell you about that is that every one of these in the criminal code is going to be approached on a case-by-case -case basis. The one we just looked at was upheld by the Supreme Court in the White case that's set out there. And the reason for that is they felt it was a reasonable limit. It's an important problem, drinking and driving, and they felt it was logical that 90% of the time a person in a driver's seat intends to drive. So it made sense to shift the burden on to the accused. No problem there. I can tell you that other burdens have been unsuccessful. I'm not going to go through them all. If you wish to look them up, you can look up these cases. Many other types of reverse onus burdens have been struck down on the basis that they're just not reasonable. Bottom line, the, uh, uh, the presumption of innocence and placing the burden of proof upon the Crown is deemed to be a, a critically important part of our criminal justice system. So the courts look at these cases very importantly and very critically and will only uphold reversals of the burden of proof where they feel it's absolutely essential to maintaining the integrity of the statutory provision, like the drinking and driving provision, where they felt that the presumption being drawn was logical and it made sense to uh, reverse the burden of proof in that situation. Another very famous one, which you'll see later on in our course, is Section 16, dealing with mental disorder. The reversal of proof, uh, burden of proof in that case was also placed on the accused, who has to prove that they were, uh, are suffering from a mental disorder. The reason being that most of the evidence to prove you are suffering from mental disorder is deemed to be in the head of the particular accused. So they, the court felt that it made sense to justify this particular reversal of the burden of proof. I'm hoping that gives you a nice introduction to what the burden of proof does and why it's so critical in criminal proceedings. In any event, uh, I hope this was useful to you. If you have any comments, please let me know. And otherwise, have a great day. Made with DoodleCast Pro.